The following program is a color feature presentation on the Hughes Sports Network. Come on, Bobby, hit somebody! Come on, let's go! This Week in Pro Football is brought to you by Hager, the Slacks people. We make everybody look good. And by the 1972 Buick, something to believe in. Hi, I'm Tom Brookshire. And I'm Pat Summerall. Last week in the NFL, there were some shots heard around the league. And Miami was one of the teams that opened up with both barrels as they scattered shot to Patriots 41-3. Looks like Don Shula's got those Dolphins tuned to perfection. Well, that's for sure. And while the Miami offense exploded, the 49er defense really teed off as they shut out the Chicago Bears. And George Allen's Redskins kept their undefeated record intact as they, too, registered a shutout by beating the Cardinals 20 to nothing. But, Pat, the loudest bang might have been when the New Orleans Saints knocked off the Dallas Cowboys. The guys from Dallas are a little bit tough for me to figure, and I think if they'd had young Archie Manning at quarterback, maybe their problems would really be solved. He, he looked like a great quarterback last week. He sure did, and we'll be right back to show you all the best action from last week's games right after this message. Last year, the two Ohio teams began a rivalry, which immediately became one of the hottest in the league. Cleveland won that first game by three points, and Cincinnati won the second by four. Last week, the annual Ohio Madness was resumed once again, and the outcome was in doubt until the final play. Well, I told you, Pat, when those two Ohio teams get together, the fur really flies. You know, Tom, there's another interstate rivalry that's been pretty hot over the years. That's the one between the New York Jets and the upstate Buffalo Bills. Last week in their home opener, the Jets had a few surprises for the winless Bills. After averaging only six points per game through their first four games, Coach Weeb Eubank decided to try a different quarterback. Not Joe Namath, not Al Woodall, but Bob Davis. And in his first start as a New York Jet, Davis on his first 12 plays found success through the simple expedient of handing off to his running backs, John Riggins and number 32, Emerson Boozer. Boozer was the Jets' workhorse as he carried 32 times for 120 yards in the game's first score. Dennis Shaw tried to get the Bills their first point since three weeks before. But linebacker Paul Crane kept the ball in the air long enough for rookie safety Phil Wise to grab it and set up another Jet touchdown.
for the score, Bob Davis faked a run. And then through to Richard Castor, and the Jets had an unprecedented 14-0 first quarter lead. In the second quarter, O.J. Simpson got Buffalo rowing with a simple off-tackle play, as only O.J. can run it. Shaw then found wide receiver Haven Moses for 40 of his 151 yards receiving for the day. For the touchdown, Shaw selected Marlon the Magician Briscoe, who is less than six feet tall with both feet on the ground, but rarely has both feet on the ground. The Bills trailed only 14 to seven at the half, but in the third period, Bob Davis went back to work. He threw a rainmaker in the direction of old pro Don Maynard. Next, Davis found a slightly younger old pro, tight end Pete Lamons, number 87. Lamon set up the Jets' third touchdown, and the day was topped off in the final period with an inside screen to John Riggins. The Jets sent the Bills reeling to their fifth straight defeat, 28 to 17. While the World's Championship was slipping away from Baltimore's Orioles last week, the Colts were in New York to prove that their title of Super Champs was very much intact. Baltimore entered Yankee Stadium last week with well-placed confidence. In the first four games of 1971, the Super Colts had outscored their opponents 101 to 17. Coach Don McCafferty had only to stay with a proven formula while the New York Giants were forced to pull out all stops in an effort to halt their three-game losing streak. Don Nottingham put the stopper on Dick Cotite, but New York's fake punt made Baltimore do an extremely uncoat like thing. The defense actually gave up a touchdown. 
Curry and Francis Tarkington found just enough end zone to give the Giants a quick 7-0 lead and furnish New York fans with delusions of grandeur. But Baltimore guards its goal line with a passion. And although Tarkington's offense would flirt with success again, the Giants' scoring had ended. Number 56, Ray May, displayed some interesting moves for a linebacker. But the real offensive motto for 71 is just give it to Boo. Boulash pounded over the giant defense for 108 yards to take over as a leading rusher in the AFC. Norm was powerful as a rookie, but the big difference in the 71 model Boulash is quickness. Enough quickness to turn a simple flare pass into six points. Boulash scored twice. Jim O'Brien kicked his 11th field goal this season without a miss, and Baltimore's marauding defense made the sunny New York afternoon seem endless for Fran Tarkington. The mad stork, Ted Hendricks, tested his offensive style as he picked off two Tarkington passes. The next giant passer, Earl Morrill, number 15, finished off the 31-7 route with two touchdown strikes to precise Ray Perkins. Just how good are the Super Colts? This week in Bloomington, the Minnesota Vikings are ready to find out. Well, it looks like the Baltimore Colts still have the kind of power that took them all the way to last year's Super Bowl in Miami. That's right, Pat. And let's take a look at a team in Miami that will present a serious challenge to the Colts in the AFC East, the Miami Dolphins. And they gave Jimmy Plunkett and company a real rough afternoon. New England's rookie quarterback, Jim Plunkett, has received a great deal of publicity lately as the 1971 Patriots are a vastly improved team. While Plunkett has been a publicity man's dream, steady Bob Greasy and his Miami teammates have virtually remained hidden from the press. But against the Dolphins, Plunkett was the man searching for a place to hide as Miami burst the Patriots' optimistic bubble. The Red Hot Dolphins got rolling in the first quarter when number 13, Jake Scott, danced over the scorching synthetic turf with a punt return. Scott's run set up the first Dolphins score, a 22-yard pass from Bob Greasy to number 81, Howard Twilley. Greasy had a field day against the young Patriot defense. He twice connected with Howard Twilley for scores and also combined with smooth Paul Warfield, number 42, for two more first half touchdowns. Warfield is perhaps the most gifted all-around wide receiver in pro football, and his touchdown-producing moves gave Miami a comfortable 31-3 halftime lead. Trailing by 28 points, Jim Plunkett knew he would have to do a lot of throwing to get the Patriots back into the game. But the Dolphin defense was ready and waiting for the strong-armed rookie as number 13, Jake Scott, again came up with a big play. While the rookie Plunkett was searching for a way to get his crumbling offense on the move, Greasy and the Dolphins rolled almost at will. This 51-yard blast by number 22, Mercury Morris, set up a final Miami touchdown by Jim Kick as the powerful Dolphins completely overwhelmed the young Patriots. Final score, Miami 41, New England 3. We'll have more exciting action on This Week in Pro Football right after this brief message.
Last week, the surprising Chicago Bears met the San Francisco 49ers in a match of contrasting lifestyles. The 49ers are new to Candlestick Park, but old Kezar Stadium traditions remain. Trademarks like the explosive offensive show that 49er football has been through the years. Last week, the big bad Chicago Bears brought their roughhouse defensive reputation to town for an interesting battle of opposites. Last year, the two styles nearly canceled each other out before the 49ers finally survived 28-21 in Chicago. This year, the game's first play indicated another interesting matchup was in store. John Brody, number 12, finessed and feather touched his way to a completion, which Chicago promptly negated with a stick. This certainly was Chicago defense, and through three quarters, the high-powered prospectors could only manage two field goals. Hitting people is still the red badge of courage in Chicago, but this year, a surprisingly lively offense has lifted the Bears to a three and one record. However, number 16, Kent Nix, discovered things have changed a bit in San Francisco, too. The previously sensational Nix to Dick Gordon combo went flat in the face of a 49er defense that posted the first San Francisco shutout since 1961. Brody closed out the game by carefully following the script. A picture pass to Gene Washington, punctuated with a bare blast. Terminated by a San Francisco touchdown and a 13-0 49er victory. While Chicago still searches for offensive consistency, the San Francisco 49ers are hoping that defense can be included in the new tradition of Candlestick Park. Well, Pat, that 49er defense looks tougher than I've ever seen it. It's going to be some race out in that NFC West. Yes, it is, Tom. And last week, the Rams remained a half game ahead of the 49ers as they continued to lead a charmed life as far as the Falcons are concerned. Norm Van Brocklin's Atlanta Falcons have never beaten the Los Angeles Rams, a fact that Norm has had plenty of time to chew on. But the Falcons' dance routine was enough to tie the Rams earlier this year, and now Atlanta was ready to break the jinx. And as the game began, it was the Rams who were jinxed as they displayed an advanced case of dropsy. Atlanta was more than happy to cover up the Rams' miscues. Then Bob Berry to Harmon Wages put the Falcons in close. And Bob Berry to Cannonball Butler helped build an Atlanta lead. Roman Gabriel to Jack Snow set up a one-yard Gabriel plunge and the Rams began to overtake the Falcons. Los Angeles finally pulled ahead as Gabriel had his big play machine in high gear and the big plays set up the short scores. Then it was dropsy again, and the Falcons' number 22, John Mallory, scooped up the fumble and raced 54 yards to bring Atlanta to within 1.17-16. A 
but with time running out, the Falcon drive was cut short when number 86, Marlon McKeever, intercepted for the second time. Atlanta's hopes were crushed and the jinx survived when on the last play of the game, Willie Ellison scored to make it 24-16 for the first place Rams. We'll be right back to This Week in Pro Football following station identification. This is the Hughes Sports Network. In the second half of our show, we'll take a look at the AFC West, where Denver sent San Diego to the basement, and where Oakland and Kansas City remain tied for the lead. Pat, we'll also take a look at the NFC Central, where two more powerhouses remain tied for first. That, of course, would be Minnesota and Detroit. And we'll look at the NFC East, which has to be the biggest shocker of the year so far, because Washington now has a two-game lead over a very surprised team from Dallas. And in our feature this week, we'll see that Mike Reed isn't the only defensive lineman in the league who has creative talents. I'll even maybe sing and dance for you a little bit. Really? Yeah. You'll have to do it alone. <laughs> we'll have no singing and dancing, but we'll have more exciting action on This Week in Pro Football right after this brief message. As we saw a few minutes ago, the San Francisco 49ers have a great defense. As we saw a few minutes ago, the San Francisco 49ers have a great defense. And part of that defense is a huge rugged lineman named Stan Heinemann. His job and joy is to wreck destruction to opposing quarterbacks. In our feature, we'll take a look at Stan's off-the-field interest, which is a bit of a contradiction to his destructive pursuits. Our feature this week, Stan Heinemann, Creative Artist. Number 80 for the San Francisco 49ers is Stan Hindman, one of the fine young defensive linemen in the NFL. Don't let anybody pull your 
On the field, Heinemann lives a life of high emotion and controlled violence. And he fits well into football's framework of confrontation. But like many in the game, football for Stan Heinemann is only a momentary experience. For off the field, he is involved in something far more lasting. When I was a kid, I used to draw in the uh, margins of books as something to eat up the time if I was particularly bored by something. In high school, I guess all my textbooks were uh, I had a scattered sketchings and uh, drawings. I didn't get really interested in sculpture until I got the opportunity to do a little bit when I went to the University of uh, Mississippi at Ole Miss. And uh, then I just started playing with it and became quite natural. It seemed uh, the easiest thing for me to do. It was uh, not like painting or drawing, a highly intense thing. Uh, it was uh, something uh, that filled in the time between the conception of an idea and actually doing it. By doing it, you uh, were relaxing. My style is probably a composite of, uh, of a lot of other things that I have seen or interpreted or that I have filtered through the past years. And I think I'm moving towards a certain style. I've picked up things from uh, the heroic moment, things from uh, Henry Moore's monumentality, uh, things from Picasso's distortion. I like some of the shapes and neutralities that you find in pop art. Well, I started this painting uh, one afternoon just to see what would happen if I uh, worked in a totally analogous color scheme. That means uh, colors that are strongly related to each other as greens and blues are. I thought this would give me more license to uh, work with textures, uh, but that I uh, wouldn't have to worry too much about uh, the way the colors related to each other because they're so close. This is a figurative piece of sculpture, which I have taken some uh, license to distort, but only for expressive purposes. I've given the woman a pregnant look by the sway of her belly, which enhances her womanness and also gives an upward sweep to the piece of sculpture. The whole thing concludes in the hair and the way her arms are holding the hair by giving the upward part of the body a floating quality. I have a little bit of trouble in making the transition every year from a creative existence wholly to a one in which involves physical contact. But I've got a strong body and it's well equipped physically and I've been taught certain techniques. When I'm going after the quarterback, when my body is performing and I'm doing those techniques, I'm not doing them purposefully. I'm doing them because it's an instinctive thing to do. It's become a part of me. I go through a depression, actually immediately as the season's over because I don't have that, that outlet. If you want to call football a kind of a pseudo-sadistic game, you can. But I think any person, if you want to call him normal, has hostility in him. I think any psychiatrist would tell you if you don't have any ways of finding an exit for that hostility, you're going to be in trouble. It is a game. If the counterculture wants to get back to a more of a tribal form of life, I think professional football is probably one of the last places that a man can go out and act aggressively without having to bow down to the system. In other words, he's doing just exactly what he wants to do out there on a the football field, in the bounds of what he's supposed to do. It's one of the last primitive things that a man can do, attack and not get thrown in jail for it. Last year, the uh, program ran a portrait of me uh, with my paintings and prints. It went up in the L.A. locker room. I remember during the ball game, one of the offensive players that I was playing against was passing by me and uh, gave me a little pat and he said, nice move, sweetie. <laughs> but I think that's all in good fun. Football players are respectful of anybody that's involved in something creative. But I think most football players have an ego and they can appreciate expression. When they're out there on a the football field, they're expressing themselves. They look at a person like myself that sculpts or paints, 
I don't think they pass it off as uh, being something that uh, football players shouldn't do. In fact, uh, we've got about three players on the team right now that paint. I don't think there's any stigma attached to being an artist and being a man, too. In Denver, two teams suffering through three-game losing streaks got together as the Broncos met the San Diego Chargers. It's been a rough year for Denver coach Lou Saban, but you can bet he's smiling a little after last week's game. In Denver, the battle between the Broncos and San Diego Chargers was a must game for Denver coach Lou Saban. Saban had been the subject of much criticism, but the winless Broncos' misfortunes have often been the result of injuries and bad breaks. Against the Chargers, Denver got a few breaks for a change. Fumble recovery by number 40, Jack Gerke, set up the first Denver score. A one-yard run by Bobby Anderson, number 11. Denver quarterback Don Horn, number 13, who had been plagued by interceptions, was right on target in the first half. He connected often with his running backs, number 11, Anderson, and number 44, Floyd Little. Horn set up the second Bronco score when he speared Floyd a little over the middle for a 25-yard gain. While the Chargers managed only two field goals, the Broncos dominated the first half on the strength of power running by Floyd Little, number 44. San Diego's John Hadle, number 21, has also been victimized by interceptions this year. This theft by linebacker Chip Myrtle, number 54, was one of several key defensive plays that shut off Charger drives. After Myrtle's interception, hard-running Bobby Anderson, number 11, set up one of two Jim Turner field goals that gave Denver a 20-6 halftime lead. In the second half, the Chargers finally got rolling on a 54-yard end-around run by rookie Billy Parks, number 32. Parks' run set up a touchdown pass to number 27, Gary Garrison. The Chargers also added a last-minute field goal, but the Broncos managed to hang on for a slim 20-16 victory. Well, the Broncos finally won a game, leaving only the Bills and the Eagles winless. Well, the Eagles won the first half against the Oakland Raiders, Pat, but unfortunately for them, football is not a 30-minute game. The sign says, Welcome Philadelphia Eagles, because the Eagles, with their new coach Ed Kayat, were 0-4, and welcome everywhere. However, the Oakland Raiders found out early in the first half that the birds were flying high, as number 28, Bill Bradley, made this interception. Number 11, Rick Harrington, to number 85, Gary Ballman, made the Eagles look like feathered fury. And Harrington, to number 37, Tom Woodishick, made it 10-0 Philadelphia at the half. For 30 minutes, the Eagles had soared high, dominating a game in which they were given little hope. But in the second half, they plummeted. Darryl LaMonica ignored an open Raymond Chester and instead hit number 25, Fred Boletnikov, for six points. And in this game, Fred Boletnikov became Oakland's all-time leading receiver with 262 receptions. LaMonica continued his bombing run by hitting Clarence Davis in the end zone. The fact that Davis was ruled out of bounds left Darrell undaunted as he came right back to number 10, Eldridge Dickey.
Not only did last week mark the fourth time in four games that the Raiders had come from behind to win, but it also showcased another Raider trademark, the stunning scoring flurry. Number 43, George Atkinson recovered an eagle fumble which helped to give Oakland three touchdowns in the span of one minute, 19 seconds. Then just to prove they were capable of more than instant touchdowns, the Raiders used number 44, Marv Hubbard, and number 32, Don Highsmith, to grind out a seven-play drive that topped off the Oakland victory at Last week, the Eagles not only lost their game, but they lost their jinx. Until last week, no team that had beaten the Eagles had been able to win its next game. But the Minnesota Vikings proved that losing in Philadelphia is not necessarily contagious. In Wisconsin, there is nothing like the Sunday afternoon in Lambeau Field when the Minnesota Vikings come out to play the Green Bay Packers. And although the Packers have had their problems, including a broken leg suffered by new head coach Dan Devine, there is reason for the new enthusiasm that surrounds the team. Part of that enthusiasm comes from two high-yield rookies. Number 16, quarterback Scott Hunter, and number 42, running back John Brockington. At the start of the fourth period, only a blocked extra point separated the venerable Vikings from the youthful Packers. This 19-yard airstrike from Hunter to number 84, Carol Dale, set up one touchdown, and a 56-yard scoring play from Hunter to Dale accounted for Green Bay's last touchdown. Overall, Hunter hit 12 passes for 221 yards, but he made three big mistakes. Number 45, Ed Shirokman positioned himself for two timely interceptions. And number 20, Bobby Bryant set the pack back with this theft. After that, the relentless people leaders closed in on the rookie Scott Hunter. Number 15, Gary Quazzo marshaled the Vikings' attack. This 27-yard touchdown to number 27, Bob Grimm, split the game open.
Earlier, Quazzo hit number 83, Stu Voigt, for an eight-yard score. Minnesota's first touchdown came on a six-yard play from Quazzo to Dave Osborne. And the Vikings won this black and blue rivalry 24 to 13. Two weeks ago, all four teams in the NFC Central were tied for first place. But now there are only two, Minnesota and Detroit. And it could stay that way until they square off in the next to the last week of the season. In Houston, even the cheerleaders are prepared for a long season. Although the Oilers were not expected to mow them down, neither were they expected to be winless in four starts before facing the hungry Detroit Lions. Watch number 34, Joe Dawkins, step politely aside, allowing Bob Bell to block this punt. Number 65, Dave Thompson recovered, and the Lions applied the pressure early. Dan Pastorini, one of Houston's highly regarded rookie quarterbacks, spent the whole afternoon in full stride before a determined Detroit rush. For Oiler fans, there was one brief glimpse of the future when Pastorini hit Charlie Joyner on a 58-yard spectacular. Pastorini completed only 15 of 40 passes, and he threw four interceptions. This one by number 20, Lim Barney, accounted for Detroit's first touchdown. Whenever it appeared that Houston might venture into Detroit's territory, they were turned back by their own mistakes. the Lions offense and number 42 Algie Taylor were going great gun. By rushing and receiving, Taylor handled the ball 20 times for 185 yards, while Taylor's running mate Steve Owens, who came into the game as the NFC's leading rusher, got 93 yards on 22 carries. Number 36, Steve Owens, got 10 tough yards to score this touchdown. And the Detroit Lions humbled Houston 31-7.
Before George Allen came to Washington, there was no recorded history of Redskin defense. They had no past, they had no future. Now Washington is the only undefeated team in the NFL, and defense has become the name of their game. At Robert F. Kennedy Stadium, the undefeated Washington Redskins sought their fifth consecutive victory. Their opponents were the disappointing St. Louis Cardinals, who were snake-bitten from the opening kickoff. Finely aged, vintage, burgundy and gold redskin defense smothered every loose ball. They cut off the deep pass and made the whip it fast Cardinal receivers pay dearly for the short ones. Their linebackers rarely allowed quarterback Pete Beathard the time to set up and throw. And when his pocket was secure, they dropped back and robbed him blind. Once again, the over-the-hill gang was led by number 32, Jack Pardee, whose three interceptions fattened his total to five for the year. But the play that clearly deflated the Cardinals came when MacArthur Lane crashed over the goal line, minus one shoe and the ball. 34-year-old Richie Pettibone came up with the football, and things were looking good for the NFL's leading cheerleader and resident miracle worker. On offense, the Redskins rammed the ball down the Cardinals' throat and rushed for nearly 230 yards. Nifty Larry Brown ran for 150 yards and put on a dazzling display of open field running. Quarterback Billy Kilmer passed sparingly, but his oft-criticized passing style was always right on the money. Receivers Roy Jefferson, number 80, and Charlie Taylor, number 42, spun through the cardinal zone silky and smooth. Although this touchdown to Taylor was called back, it mattered little as Billy Kilmer called his own number and his beach ball body bounced into the end zone and Washington won a 20 nothing shutout victory. Head coach George Allen's undefeated Redskins now owned a fat two-game lead over the faltering Cowboys and things were looking up in the nation's capital. While the Redskins' defense continues to surprise, the Cowboys' offense continues to be an enigma, Tom. Enigma? If that's a one-cell protozoic creature, then it certainly describes the Dallas attack against the Saints last week. In New Orleans, everyone drooled at the prospect of getting well against a Dallas team seemingly bent on self-destruction. But Archie Manning found out early that the Cowboys feast on rookie meat. While Manning felt the force of the doomsday defense, receiver Dan Abramowitz, number 46, found out just how powerful national television is. But the young St. Tufts gave as well as they got, and the Dallas Colossus began to crumble. The defense forced six Cowboy turnovers, the most spectacular coming on Dallas Howell's 60-yard return of an interception. Manning's scrambling style of generalship eroded the Cowboys' ability to pursue and enabled him to combine with Tony Baker for the Saints' first score.
The Saints turned around the game for good in the second quarter when Al Dodd returned Mike Clark's missed field goal 77 yards. Only Dodd's sheer exhaustion spared the Cowboys. But just two plays later, Archie Manning turned an apparent loss into another Saint touchdown and a 17-0 halftime lead. Reserve quarterback Roger Staubach produced two second-half touchdowns for Dallas. One went to Gloucester Richardson, number 31. The other came on a sideline shot to Bob Hayes that narrowed the St. lead to a mere three points, 17-14. But on this Sunday, the plucky Saints were not to be denied. Another touchdown on a rollout by the boy wonder from Mississippi ensured New Orleans' second stunning upset of the year, 24-14. And for Dallas, it may well be the beginning of the end. The Saints over the Dallas Cowboys. I'm sure glad we didn't have to pick that little beauty. Uh, I'm seven and five, and correct me if I'm wrong. I think you're six and six. You are correct. I'm six and six. <laughs> what about the Redskins in Kansas City, Pat? Everybody, I think, continues to be surprised by the Redskins, but there is a lot of talent in Kansas City. I like the Chiefs. I'm going to go with the Redskins because Billy Kilmer can throw spirals, and he's doing a great job for Allen. He sure is. What about Baltimore and Minnesota? There's two great defenses there. Well, I saw Minnesota last week, and it seems that if they get the ball under normal circumstances, if you punt to them or kick off to them, they can't move the ball much. But let that defense get them a break. Let them get a fumble or pick off an interception, and they'll, they'll just choke you to death right then. They did it all three times for their touchdowns against Green Bay. I like the Purple Gang. I'll go with Minnesota. I'm going to go with Baltimore because the return of John United should do something to that team, too. Yeah, it should. Uh, he'd probably play a lot this week. What about our old teams quickly? What about New York against the Eagles? Well, I like mine if you'll take yours. I'll go with the green and white. Okay, we'll be back next week to show you what happens. I'm Pat Summerall. And I'm Tom Brookshire, and we'll see you next week. Promotional consideration for ground transportation provided by Budget Rent-A-Car, who rents the Buick Opal and other fine cars. This Week in Pro Football has been brought to you by the 1972 Buick. Something to believe in. And by Hager, the Slacks people. We make everybody look good. This program has been a color feature presentation on the Hughes Sports Network.